Hello and welcome to Mediumship Matters with me, Hannah McIntyre. How are you doing? I'm dedicating today to another set of listener questions and philosophy and all things spirit, thinky, ussy, trying to understand what's going on. And I wanted to start by talking about a couple of questions that students have asked, discussions that we've had on the school about spirit and why it works the way that it does. And I was talking to them about um, how no's are not always no's. And I know that I've sort of covered this, but I'm going to just quickly clarify for you. When you first start doing evidential mediumship or indeed any form of mediumship, when you get no's, it is so painful, so mortifying. It kind of it exactly lights up that part of you that says you shouldn't be doing this. You can't do this. You're a fraud. And it... For me, it was such a trigger that it would pull me completely out of my power every time I got a no. It would send me deep into my imposter syndrome where I would stay. And the only way to kind of get through that is experience. I'd love to tell you that there is a shortcut, but in my opinion, the way that no stop bothering you is you have so much of them, so many of them, the charge of them isn't there anymore. It doesn't light up that part the same way. You kind of, for want of a better expression, disassociate from nose. And I honestly think that is the process. When I first started as a medium, I believed that when I got good enough, I wouldn't get nose anymore. And I can tell you now, I still get nose. I still get nose all the time. But often with nose, it is something they've forgotten about that they suddenly twig later and go, oh, bloody hell, I've just realised what that was. And in absolute honesty, because I've done so many demonstrations, because I've worked with spirit for such a long time now and really put myself through it, when I get a no now, it, it just doesn't impact me. And I know that I, I reckon at least 90% of the no's that I get become yeses later. And that's a lot. And I'm not saying that I never get it wrong because of course I'm a human being, I'm fallible, I do get things wrong, I do make things up. But I will say this, when I get no's now, if I know that I'm in my power and I know that I'm cooking on gas as I would call it, I... It's very hard for me not to say to the sitters and the people in the audience, are you sure? Are you sure that's a no? Um, because I really, and sometimes I do say that actually, if I'm honest, because I really do trust into it. I did a demonstration the other day, and forgive me if I've mentioned this on the podcast, I feel like I'm here, there, everywhere, and because I'm teaching so much at the moment, all of these stories are really relevant to students, so I tell them, and then I think, did I already say this? But I was demonstrating uh, locally, and there was a grandmother that I could connect with so clearly, so strongly, and nobody was taking her, and nobody was putting their hand up. And my friend was there and she was just laughing at the fact that I just like bellowed into the mic, take your nan, until someone put their hand up. Um, and it's not about bullying people, but I do think that audience members are nervous and they want to be really, really sure. They want to be 100% sure. And then sometimes, even when they are really sure, they still, for whatever reason, can't put up their hand. So no's don't bother me the way that they used to. And in fact, sometimes I think that they create a magic. Because if you say no to me about something and then you go home and you realise that 
that plate I was talking about does have a, a blue pea flower on it, then you might, is there something kind of magical about that? There's something kind of mind blowing about something that you've looked at every day or looked at a lot and you haven't seen the detail of it that spirit draw your attention to. I think I was talking to my husband about it the other day because it's easy to moan about the nose, but actually it's quite incredible when someone goes away and the penny drops. I think that creates almost more magic for them. And who am I to get in the way of that process? And one of the questions that one of my students asked is, why would spirit not bring through a piece of evidence that can be easily recognised or a spirit that can be easily recognised? And I think there's many reasons for this. So I believe as mediums, we are limited by our brains, by our energy, by our knowing, by our experiences, what pieces of evidence we can receive. Because if spirit could control it, they would just come in and say, hello, my name is Marjorie. I lived in Devon. I had four cats. My husband was Peter. My son was Michael. My daughter is Emily. They'd say it. It would be done. And I think the limitation in this space is yes, that spirit aren't actually speaking, which we've discussed many times, but also um, the medium, what the medium is able to receive, what the medium is open to, to getting and what the medium is able to be vulnerable enough to trust into. And that can be ch challenging for everyone involved. So on a one-on-one -on -one scenario, this is why I always recommend if you're doing one-on-ones, you just cut to the chase and ask your sitter who they want to hear from. Because if you've got five spirits around that person, are you going to connect with the spirit that they want to hear from? Maybe. But actually, energetically, in that vulnerable space of opening up, are you more likely to connect with the spirit that feels most compatible to you? Just like if you were to walk into a room full of strangers, you will talk to the ones that have that vibe that feels right to you. As you guys know, I have recently joined the gym. That has been surprisingly nerve wracking, but it's also very interesting because I've started to make little gym friends in the classes. And the reason why I've started to make little gym friends is because I've been looking around and smiling and being open, seeing who smiles and is open back. And then it goes from a little smile and a nod to a hello, then to a hello, how are you this week? Then to, a, oh my goodness, wasn't that difficult? And so on and so forth. And then you start saying, what do you do? What's this like? You find out information, what are you doing at the weekend? And conversation moves. And just like that, when you're doing mediumship, it's the same version of that, but just sped up. So you open up to the spirit that you feel most comfortable with. And that isn't necessarily who the sitter wants to hear from, but that's not spirit's fault. That's just us. It's not our fault either. We're human. You can't automatically go to the spirit you don't feel comfortable with because that might not be who they want to hear from either. <laughs> so it is a difficult place to be in. And when you do connect to that spirit, why would they bring through information that people can't understand? Well, I don't think they do. I think everything about that spirit is already there and present. And it's us as mediums that are opening up and tapping into it, not the other way around. And so I don't think spirit are necessarily bringing through evidence that we can't understand. I do feel, as I'm saying this, I also feel like sometimes they do prioritise things and they do know what's going to give that sitter an aha. So I guess if they're working with you as a medium and you've got a thousand different valves open of information that you can take, that gives the spirit enough scope to be able to work with bits of evidence that perhaps will give them a massive reaction, perhaps really excite them. I mean, there is nothing that beats turning to a, a grieving wife and saying, you're wearing his 
wedding ring around your neck on a chain which is hidden in a roll neck and for her to pull it out there's nothing that beats that but there is also bits that are validated when they get home and give that sitter that bit of magic so I think if you're very very open then spirit can play and you have to accept that that's part of the job it's not about making you look good all the time it's about doing the job But I think if you have a limited number of valves open, then they will work within the remit of what you are open to. And that can be a challenge in itself. And that isn't anybody's fault. And it isn't a permanent state. So there are times when I am massively open, massively in my power, really able to receive loads of really specific information from spirit and then there are also moments in the same nights with the same dems with just depending on how tired I'm getting how I'm feeling how the audience is responding how much energy I'm getting from them when some of my valves are shut and I am feeling it like it's harder and more difficult and more complicated that is the job and it doesn't matter how much you do it that's always how it's going to be for you so I don't think spirit bring through spirits that can't be recognised. I think perhaps sometimes we land on spirits that can't be recognised. Except for in practice scenarios. Because when you are developing as a medium, the need, the charge of the reading is not with the sitter as it is when you're working professionally with real people who are really grieving. I'm not saying practice sitters aren't real, but you know what I mean. When you are doing practice, when you are trying to learn, you're trying to develop your mediumship, the need is with you as a medium. It is not with the sitters. So the spirits that you get in, therefore, may not be who they expect to hear from, may not be spirits they even remember that well, or, you know, why would it, if you've got grandma, granddad, mum, sister in spirit, why would you get your grandparents next door neighbour? Well, spirit wouldn't do that, would they? Mediums can land on the wrong one, yes, but also I think in practice scenarios, the spirits that um, step closest to us, that are like lit up energetically for us to work with, well, those spirits are, it's almost like, this doesn't happen when you're working with a real, a real sitter, but when you're working in a practice scenario, it's almost like all the other spirits disappear and the one that you land on is the one to teach you in your development. The one that is there for your unfoldment for for to give you the lessons that you need and then i just and now i'm thinking of course but if spirit can do that why wouldn't they do that in a reading oh it's so interesting so therefore are we actually when we're doing practice just landing on who we land on and there's always a lesson to there's always a lesson to be found in every reading still for me after all this time still a lesson to be found in every reading so is it actually that they're not trying to teach us is it that we're just landing on who we're landing on It's so inter- it's so interesting the experience of mediumship on a platform versus on a one on one. I Oh, I don't know. I'd love your thoughts. I've confused myself now. These are important things to think about though. And the thing is, with all mediumship, none of us we don't know. We don't know for sure. We're doing something intangible. I mean, provable to a certain extent, but never provable enough to convince a naysayer. And we're in that space. So nobody knows for sure. And all we can do is ask the questions and expand into the vulnerability of not fully knowing the answer. 
And that's where I'm just sitting right now. I mean, spirit might bring some more guidance in about it, but right now in this moment, hmm, not sure. And then another one of my students was asking me if spirit advance. And we had such an interesting conversation about that. And that's really stuck with me because logically, if spirit are beyond space and time, then all of the advancement has already happened because they are only in now. Now, to give a bit of context for this, we were talking about evidence and she was saying that she believes that spirit's ability to give evidence to her has expanded. And then we were discussing whether that has actually expanded from spirit or whether that is an expansion from her. Are spirit changing what she's receiving or is she opening up to more? And such an interesting thing to think about I mean really that just comes back to in my opinion the the meaning of life why are we here why are we here when we could be in spirit which is better why are we here where it's difficult and hard and painful and we feel separated from the spirit world from our loved ones from each other why are we here for life and I believe that we come here for contrast. I believe that we come here to experience the dark so we can appreciate the light. The other day I was driving my car and um, chewing, chowing down on fistfuls of cashews. But you know, I'm going to ruin cashews for you now as they have been ruined for me. I saw a Facebook post that showed me the fingers of the ladies that shell the cashews and their blackened, sore, wizened fingers. And now I feel a little bit guilty when I eat a cashew. Now I remember when I first uh, started working with Spirit and um, one of my first teachers, when she was talking about the best energetic foods to eat and the best energetic foods to eat grew on trees because the tree itself wasn't killed to be able to provide the product. So it was a kind of do no harm, which I completely understand. But cashews grow on bloody trees. And actually in the process of shelling them, you've got women paid peanuts, excuse the pun, um, in, in pain. And I was thinking, I was talking to Spirit as I was driving my car about how it really is impossible to live on this planet without causing pain. And don't you think it's a great irony that we are causing that pain, but that we have also chosen to be here and be aware that we cause that pain and in that space. At one point, I was drinking Oatly oat milk and then I saw online that lots of people are upset because the oats that are used in the production of that oat milk are then fed to pigs who are ultimately slaughtered and eaten. And people were getting up in arms about that. And I know that we, you know, sometimes it's to the extreme, but it is fascinating to me. There's just, you can't drive your car down the road without killing something. And you know, oil, is, isn't oil made of dead bodies? Like it's just, it's, it's such an interesting space to be in. That could be wrong about oil. I might've just made that up. Um, where we exist and we have this connection to spirit and this not wanting to do any harm, but we are surrounded by absolute dickheads and everything we do harms something. And being in that space, I just think there's something really interesting in it for the soul's experience on earth because I'm sure there are other incarnations where perhaps we don't eat, um, perhaps we float so we never squash anything on the ground. I don't know. It just feels like earth is brutal. Somebody asked at one of my Dems the other day if I believe this is the only form of incarnation and I said, God, I hope not. Like this is, this is not the peak, is it, of what the universe can provide, surely but it's so interesting to think about. We, we grow up and then from childhood, from
from puberty, I guess. We are just slowly decaying <laughs> until we leave. And that kind of clock that is always ticking and always letting us know, the mirror that is telling us that our time is reduced. I mean, it's whether you feel good when you look in the mirror or not, it's still that reminder that it's short here. And I feel like that serves the purpose. Now, does that purpose advance a soul? And and this is the question. And, you know, my student disagreed with me and that's apps. Oh God, I'm so glad. I love that. Good. Argue with me, disagree with me. But it's just so interesting to think about. Is the very desire to advance a human desire? Do souls have that desire? We don't know, do we? And I could be wrong. She could be right. We could be somewhere in the middle, but it's fascinating to think about. You know, the idea of souls evolving, I think, is the Buddhist thing, uh, reincarnating until you reach nirvana. And, you know, that is a teaching that has come through a human. Is that real? We don't know. Souls may be evolving. And then how does evolvement work when everything that ever was and everything that ever will be and everything that has been is everything that is a soul experiences when they're not in this physical incarnation of a meat suit? As I always say, when the um, philosophy gets deep, what, how I wish that we were all around a campfire right now having a chat. Um, but those of you that are coming on the retreat in July... That is exactly what we will be doing. <laughs> and I can't wait because sometimes you just need a fire, a blanket, a mug of hot chocolate and some deep questions about the universe. OK, on to your questions now, not just me Whittering around in the philosophy of it all, I've got an email from Tiffany and Tiffany says, Hello, Hannah, I'm not a medium, but I've been a sitter several times. Do you feel that when you're giving evidential mediumship readings, your energy just blends better with some sitters? A lot of my friends have been to several different local mediums, all of whom have definitely been genuine. I find, though, that one friend might rave about an experience they had had with a particular medium who gave the most specific details and amazing evidence. Meanwhile, another friend might have just had an OK experience with that medium. Maybe they could take a lot of the evidence, but the details weren't very specific. I know from listening to your podcast that sometimes as a medium, you just have one of those readings that doesn't go as well as you'd like. I'm wondering if you feel that has something to do with the energy of the sitter. I don't just mean whether they're sceptical or open or whether they're having a good or bad day. I mean, can a reading flow better if you and the sitter have similar energy? All the best, Tiffany. I do think that sitter's energy changes a reading. I also think that sitter's expectation can change a reading. So this is funny because this ties in with what I was talking about, about opening up to evidence and who's in control of that. And I do believe it's the medium. And I do believe that there are some sitters, in my opinion, that make it easier for you to trust. And I don't think it's necessarily to do with um, similar energies. I think it's when you get somebody that is really responsive to a reading they look like they look like they've blown your mind so I know somebody who is a really really responsive sitter they are so excited to be there they are so supportive they absolutely believe in spirit and they are blown away like obviously blown away by their facial expressions every time that you do a reading for them. And that makes them look like a great sitter. They are a great sitter. I know that I've done really great work for them because they make you feel so comfortable. Um, and that's, that's such a blessing. Now, let me get my thoughts in order. This is what I mean about the problem with how mediumship is portrayed in the media. 
because if you've got a show where they're trying to prove that mediums are charlatans, then you'll get very non-responsive sitters who are very clinical in it. The medium will struggle because the energy is very testing. And so that just proves the naysayer's point. If you get something like Tyler Henry, Life After Death, which I loved, and I loved that show, but don't get me wrong, every single one of those sitters was picked because they are a responsive animated sitter. If they were giving nothing back, only speaking in monosyllabic one syllable words, if they were um, not giving a lot of, oh, oh my God, or crying, they wouldn't make the cut of the show. Now, I don't know how it works. I've never been involved in TV, but my guess is that they, the, the staff interview people before they are chosen to be sitters to check that they are um, enthusiastic, outgoing, they express emotion, that you can go on a journey with how they're feeling. And then I'm guessing if for any reason they clam up in front of the camera, they're not used. They're cut from the edit. So it does impact the mediumship and how you are, what you can get. And, you know, it is very hard because a mediumship reading by default is being tested. It is someone sat in front of you saying, you said you could do this. Now prove to me that you can. And I guess there's varying degrees of that. I also think sitters' expectations can sometimes be, be challenging. Like I said, you know, if you say I've got um, purple flowers here and they are waiting for you to say geranium, like it's not that spirit aren't saying geranium, it's just that the, the medium in that moment is not open enough to be able to receive it or is receiving it and feels a bit nervous so has decided to kind of play it safe. And that is the process. So um, yes, a reading can definitely flow better if you and the sitter, the medium and the sitter have a rapport, if the sitter is responsive, if the sitter is open, if the sitter is excited and animated and is making that medium feel good and investing a lot of their energy in the reading. That for me makes the difference. I hope that makes sense. Next up is a question from Alison and Alison says, Hi Hannah, love, love, love listening to your podcast. I've always known so much about what you are sharing with us. Your information and clarity of spirit really just took me deeper and closer to my purpose of being here. Thank you for sharing your amazing gift with us. I'm attending your spirit circle on February the 27th. Well, you've been, I hope you enjoyed it. Can't wait to experience you in the now. I am curious of your thought of microdosing, so I, I can never say that word, mushrooms, silicobine, I don't know how you say it, but you all know what I mean, magic mushrooms. I have heard so many amazing benefits of this without the effects of actually dosing to get high. Does a microdose affect our ability to tune into spirit? I feel like it opens us up to an even closer closer to that frequency through meditation whilst dosing. Does that make sense? Ha ha, I find myself saying that a lot after listening to your podcast. I keep thinking, and I might do it at some point, of making a listener bingo. So every time I say something like, does that make sense? Or um, I might have said this before, <laughs> or anything else, you can tick it off <laughs> and play along. Anyway, I haven't made it yet, but it makes me laugh, the very thought of it. Anyway, Alison, I am not an expert in this subject. I have done a micro dose of mushrooms once at a cacao ceremony. Um, I just want to add in here, cacao is freaking grim. I, on, uh, anyway, that's beside the point. It's way too bitter. Just because it's spiritual doesn't mean it needs to be like... Give me a hot chocolate any day. <laughs> anyway, that's a little aside. 
So I have done a micro dose of mushrooms. Um, and then we did a meditation. Did I have a lovely meditation visualization? Yes, I did. Do I feel like it was any different? No, I don't. But that was only my first time. Now, I had a great conversation with somebody that I will keep anonymous in case they don't want everything out there, who is a great believer in microdosing with mushrooms. And the way that she explained it to me is about neural pathways. So your brain works a certain way. And say, for example, your brain is working on a depression or a unhappiness or a self-judgment and it's running that program. You need to imagine the programs as if tracks in the snow and they get deeper and deeper and deeper every time you have that thought. Well, when you take mushrooms with intention and focus, you ask for that clarity and that healing and it's like fresh snow has fallen. And then what you have to do is make sure that the new route that you plow is of a different frequency, is positive, is self-loving, is self-kind. That is how she told me you get the most from mushrooms. Now, that makes perfect sense to me, but I don't think it's the only way to reprogram your brain. Now, do I believe that doing that will help you open up to spirit? Yes, in a sense, because I think thinking positively is a massive chunk of it. You have to face your own resistance to do mediumship and your self-doubt. And if you're particularly in a bad place, then you have to kind of work through that stuff first. And this is the thing about mediumship. I don't think you can go straight from, as I was, damaged and unhappy to evidential medium. I think you have to go on a healing journey to be able to do the work. So you don't need mushrooms to do that, but I, from my understanding, mushrooms can help with that. But there are so many other different, I mean, meditation in itself can help with that if you're that kind of person. For me, just taking time for myself, unwinding a bit, walking in the woods with my dogs, that does the same thing. So there are many, many different ways. But yeah, I hope that answers it as best as it I can. I obviously can't go into the nitty gritty because I am not a mushroom plant medicine expert. But that is my understanding. If anyone wants to weigh in who has more knowledge than me, you would be very welcome. Okay. Next up, I had a lovely email that I just wanted to acknowledge from Miri Miriam, um, who is from New York, and she just messaged to say how much she loves it. And she sent me this beautiful um, story of her dad and her spiritual awakening following her dad and all of the clever signs that he has sent. And I just wanted to say thank you, Miriam. It was a great read. And I'm really grateful that you sent that to me. Isn't your dad clever? Okay, next up is a question from Denise. And Denise says, Hi, Hannah, it's lovely to have you back. My dog walks just weren't the same without you. Hoping you can help with my question, which is, which element am I? I'm an Aquarius, always been drawn to water, love the lakes, beaches, swimming, but then found out my sign was the air element. I've done online quizzes and always get a different answer. I was wondering how I could research this myself. In honesty, Denise, I don't know. <laughs> I don't work with elements in the sense that um, I believe that we come here for all of them. You're not... There's... I love the sea, the ocean, I love lakes, I love looking out over sunsets, over the water, I love the sound of the waves on the beach, but I also love the smell of the earth in the woods and 
the feeling of it growing and being out in nature and hiking and having that experience. But I love sitting by a campfire and watching the flames flicker and feeling myself being warmed. I love the feel of a gentle breeze on my skin on a hot day or watching the sheets on my washing line blow in the wind. I love the sound the leaves make in the trees when a gust of wind takes them all. So I think ultimately we're all a bit of everything and I know that there are fire signs and earth signs which attribute certain characteristics to our star sign but I also believe that we are here for the fullness and, and experience of all. And that is the best that I can do because I'm, I'm not an astrologist. I don't know much about the elements. Um, I know that I'm Capricorn. I believe that's Earth, but I often forget. Um, and if I've just said that wrong, please don't come and beat me up. And I think you just have to accept that you are many things, many facets. And, you know, I'm Earth, but I don't like, I don't like the feeling of mud on my skin. I like the smell of it but I don't, I don't like it. I don't like weeding. I don't like touching mud. My friend does tough mudder runs and um, dog runs in muddy woods and it's just not for me. I don't like that feeling. Um, so I think we're all bits of everything and all you can do is just trust how you feel. So helpful, but not helpful at all. You're very welcome. Right, let me find my next one. Okay, next up is another Alison. Hi, Hannah. Firstly, let me say thank you to you for the quite frankly inspiring podcast. I love your honesty. Thanks. So my journey into mediumship has been eventful and I've worked really hard, classes, mentorship week in, week out for the last four years to get where I am. I know I am no different from many others in this respect. I've just made the move to be a full-time medium, scary, and I'm now doing stalls and dems at events, big, always go big or go home kind of girl, and small, and free online live demonstrations. However, I kept my mediumship private from family and work colleagues and now face the, yep, this is me. To add to the situation, I have challenging personal situation. Yes, we all have baggage and I'm stalked and slated for pretending to speak with dead people. It's not as easy as just cutting said person out of my life as I have responsibilities. I know you say people in your local church disagree with what you do. My question is, how do you carry on and not let them bring you down? I love mediumship. I just made the decision to do it full time. But knowing some people think I'm the devil incarnate is tough. And any tips you have to navigate this apart from big girl pants, I have plenty of those, would be so appreciated. Oh, girl, I actually don't. <laughs> and I, it's so funny, isn't it? Because I still, I still get abuse online. And I've seen um, TikToks of people, you know, pretending, saying, you know, I like to steal energy from people. So I just go on, on sites and write this and you watch all the energy I get and things like that, which I completely agree is the process but it doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. And there is this weird energy that I feel that kind of spikes out of messages. So just to put it in perspective, yesterday was a bad day. Um, I had three, because I'm running an ad on Facebook at the moment, I had three different men go onto my page and tell me that I'm fraudulent, that I'm insane, um to f off to f off and die um that i'm a charlatan and i would be lying alison if i said that was just water off a duck's back it does upset me it does hurt my feelings i block them there's no point in trying to get into a dialogue with somebody like that but um it is painful to me and it's doubly annoying because I've paid money to get my business in front of them. Thanks, Facebook algorithm. So um, it is really, really hard. I would suggest 
that if you've got people in your family who don't agree with it, you block them from your business page. So you can still stay interacting with them on your personal Facebook, but they can't access or see your business stuff. Because if they don't believe it anyway, they don't need to see it. They don't need to know what you're doing. Um, So that would be my first step. Um, is just giving yourself just a little bit of power back. But yeah, sometimes you can't bin people off and you just have to let them say what they're going to say, even though it's painful. Let them believe what they want to believe, even though you know differently. I was doing a dem the other day and it was for, there was a, a dad husband that came in for a daughter wife. And the first thing he said to me is, I would have told them they were wasting their money going tonight. And they both cracked up because isn't that the truth? You know, he was here in life going, don't waste your money on those mediums, bloody charlatans, rip off. But he's still using the services of one to make contact with his wife and daughter. Now he's passed. And I guess the more things like that I do, I just think, okay, well, your soul can apologise to me on the other side. And you will know what you know. Does it make it hurt less? Not really. Does it make me feel incredibly exposed and vulnerable? Yes, it does. I may have told you guys all this. There's another one for the bingo. But uh, when I first got a much expanded reach on Facebook, I had a letter sent to my house And the letter was, it had a spiky, violent energy from the minute it arrived. I opened it as if it had razor blades in because it just had that kind of feeling. And somebody had written me an anonymous note saying that they were having an affair with my husband. And, well, no, that their partner was having an affair with my husband. And it had been going on for this amount of time and um, that I'm not a very good psychic because if I was a good psychic, I would have picked up on that. But worse still, she, the woman who was apparently having an affair with my husband, had come to me for a reading and I hadn't picked up on that affair. And I was lucky in a sense because um, it was lockdown and my husband had just been at home constantly. Um, And in honesty... The day before that letter arrived, because obviously it was upsetting, if you had said to me, what would you like your husband to do? I would probably have gone, go and have an affair. Go and find somebody else to talk to. I'm so fed up because we've just been in this, you know, in the house, in this unit. At one point during lockdown, which my husband often repeats to me because I had a bit of a tantrum and I said, we've been nowhere. We've seen no one. We've done nothing I don't want to talk to you because I was just so fed up with having the same conversations again and again and again um love and light you know and so it was really good timing for me but the energy and the intention behind that letter were brutal they were painful that was somebody who hated me or hated what I did enough to try and cause damage and pain to my relationship. And so, no, it doesn't get easier, Alison, um, but you just don't let it stop you. And that's all that you can do, my lovely. So big girl pants, big girl pants at the ready. Keep going. Also, why I recommend that you find some sort of community of developing, developed, well, we're all still developing, mediums that are working, where that they can all sort of hang out and talk and share and be in that space of, this is what someone said to me, oh my God, I had someone say this to me, it's so hard, isn't it? And you don't feel like you're doing it so on your own. Okay, I think we're gonna stop there looking at the clock. It is time. But I hope that you've enjoyed today's episode. Now, we've only got a few episodes left of season five before we break again and we will be back in September. So get your questions in now. I can't guarantee that they will make the show, but we will try. And if not, I will save them for season six 
And I look forward to catching up with you all soon. And as mentioned in those listener questions, I am currently running a free monthly circle um, just to help you connect to spirit. It's a guided visualization meditation and then a chance to ask questions and it's completely free. So please do um, pop over onto my website and have a look. Take care everyone and I will catch up with you soon.